Infinite Warfare, a game that was met with immediate disapproval from fans and the community as it wasn't Call of Duty, a space epic that was of course way different than what anyone was really expecting. I remember at the time before the reveal of the game that people were expecting Ghost 2 given the campaign cliffhanger and the entry prior to this as well as others were expecting another entry into the Modern Warfare series to avoid another pitfall that like at the time was Ghosts, which was the less than ideally received over its main year of support. The game was revealed and quickly it climbed the ranks on YouTube's most disliked video list, and even to this day, it currently sits at number 6 with 3.81 million dislikes, and at the time, it peaked at number 2 on the charts just behind Justin Bieber's baby. But admittedly, at the same time, the video had also the most likes of any trailer that Call of Duty had ever seen. So you can take that any way that you will, but... Anyways, the game had a lackluster reception and was largely attributed to Cell simply because of the nostalgia factor of Modern Warfare Remastered being tethered to the game's Legacy Edition for $80. But while player numbers may not have been ideal or peaked throughout its year of support and even may have had players taken away by the counterpart of MWR, Infinite Warfare really wasn't that bad and may have just been a product of the wrong place and wrong time on top of just, well, a wrong setting. Today, bear with me as we may be examining what is an unpopular opinion to many, but get past the generic things and you'll find that there's a lot of redeeming factors or cool features that if it wasn't a space epic or following Black Ops 3 in very similar shoes, it could have been something fantastic for all players. Today, we're going to look at why Infinite Warfare really wasn't all that bad. Let's start out with, well, campaign, the mode that was the narrative driven force that kind of dictated how everything else would play out. While sure it stemmed off a conflict rooted not only just on the ground, but also across the solar system, it was a brilliant display of storytelling as the classic story of conflict at home and abroad took a much wider approach. Again, not only just by country, but also with the colonization of other locations in our solar system. Ultimately, the story itself is gripping and you can connect with the characters with an ending that may not entirely be as pleasant as everyone would have hoped for. It's not a happy party of everyone saved the day and nothing bad happened. Instead, it's a gritty story and will keep you engaged, but ultimately, the narrative that shaped the rest of the creative vision and where things like multiplayer went was solid and worth at least one playthrough. But for the majority of viewers, campaign may not be your main focus. It may be something you play once and may not tremendously care about. So in terms of things like MP, we're going to focus a little more on that, but definitely still worth it narratively. On the MP front, well, there were a bunch of cool features that were introduced within Infinite Warfare and some things that built and expanded upon some of the classic and recent gameplay improvements that we'd seen in the franchise at the time. Let's start with the cool features that to this day we haven't really seen much of outside of Infinite Warfare and made their mark but may not have been recognized as much because, well, a lot of people just immediately dismissed it. Things like mission teams were introduced. This was another way to go in-depth into grinding and progression. You ended up previously having just, say, your dark matter you could grind for, you had your ranking you could grind for, but in Infinite Warfare, you had not only the dark matter equivalent being something that required you to end up grinding through the ranks plus your weapons, but mission teams also added another aspect to the game that you could end up grinding out and ranking up. Each had their own individual ranking system with their own rewards in that ranking specific to the mission team. These were viewable in the mission team depot of the quartermaster and every 10, 20, 30, 40, and rank 50 all granted specific weapon variants, some definitely way better than others as rewards for grinding the ranks. Each mission team also had specific challenges associated with them, kind of similar to how field orders were specific within Ghost the Game previously from Infinity Ward, but seemingly random, and it would take you off your main aspects of your game and task you with doing something that may have been a little more out of your comfort zone, but also was something that may have opened you up to a different way to play the game. Ultimately, it was just another way to go more in-depth with grinding out the game and ranking up something and offered a unique perspective into another side quest, if you will, to the standard MP that we knew of. Other things like the score streak lab were introduced in which, similar to how Advanced Warfare allowed you to have variants of score streaks, this allowed you to open up and use different abilities and different variations of the score streaks already in place, and you could end up unlocking them at your own pace and choosing which ones you wanted, simply offering another level of play for the user. Another thing that was really cool but we didn't see all that much with and had a lot of potential with was the Quartermaster Cypher. Think of cheat codes from your favorite games as a kid, and this was essentially that. 
It popped up mysteriously, and for months, the hunt was on to see what sort of cipher this would then produce and what you could get out of this. I remember seeing some crazy and zany theories, and some were just downright awesome to think about, but really, none were found for absolute ages. The most common theory that I remember seeing, and, and again, I don't know how much validation there was for this, was that this was a way to input a code from Activision support for, say, lost items or redemption of things for troubles and issues. So, say you had an issue, whatever it may be, that prevented you from having some playtime or just an enjoyable time, similar to how a restaurant would give a voucher or something similar. It was just a sort of customer service thing. So, this was something that was a mystery for quite some time, and I don't know how many more outside of this were found, but one fun fact, if you guys do want to jump on for yourselves, there is one that works publicly as of right now. If you go to it and type Paul of Duty, you'll end up getting a bundle of five fully dupe protected rare supply drops. So while it's only 15 items guaranteed that you don't have in a game coming up on three years old, it's also 15 dupe protected items for just putting in a code. But the cipher was something that I think wasn't really used to its full potential, but understand the reasoning as to why it was put in place as it is out of the public realm, but also an easier way to bridge that gap between support and player, but something definitely cool that could have hit some Easter eggs around the menus or in-game or something like that, and been something of a fun community involvement thing that was introduced. Outside of that, other things that we have seen, but also were really a start and catalyst here for this, were game battles integration. A lot of players don't necessarily care about competitive, but it is something that for those that do, you can end up linking your game battles account for competitive matches and launch right into games if you had scheduled and everything alike right from the game itself you didn't have to join up on anybody it pretty much created its own easy matchmaking for game battles which honestly is pretty cool having done game battles way back in the day with ghosts and a little bit with advanced warfare it was definitely a pain to try and get everybody all together and then on host so to be able to do this in a centralized call of duty specific area was definitely awesome core gameplay wise the game honestly had a lot of cool things as well the create a class was built on by this time the classic pick 10 system you could custom tailor your weapons to be stacked out with attachments at the expense of your perk selection or you could go full-on heavy with utility and perks without much weaponry at your disposal or anything in between the choice was entirely yours things like combat rigs or the specialist equivalent came back here for this and black ops 3 introduced a few things to cod that first being of course the hero based gameplay style with specialists and things like wall running in the game and while i personally think that things like wall running and infinite warfare was smoother and a more refined mechanic the combat rigs looked to expand upon the specialist system in place from black ops 3. you had six combat rigs warfighter merc synaptic ftl striker and phantom each with a payload and a trait essentially a passive and active ability each of those had your choice of three abilities, but you could only choose one for your passive and one for your active, thus expanding though on the specialist system where you could only choose one ability, lethal or tactical, giving a newer and more expanded range of play for the users compared to say Black Ops 3. Unfortunately, people did find this to be sort of gimmick with Black Ops 3 that at the time wore out a lot of people and displeased them over time. And so to see very similar scenario the year following, it wasn't entirely well received, but they did open up much more styles of play for players with those rigs weaponry was also something that was absolutely big because infinity ward did quite a bit of work with the weaponry and trying to keep it tethered to fan favorites but also push the boundaries opening up more options that fit the specific setting of the game and things like your volk were an energy variation of the classic ak-47 things like the nv4 were a variation built upon the basic m4a1 things like the karma were built on the vector the rpr evo was built on the ripper and so on but also it may have been tough to include some fan favorites so they did their best but they also indeed added classic weapons simply in the classification of classic these were the osa the mac tab 45 the tf 141 the s ravage and the m1 and were all the classics of the arx 160 the ump 45 the intervention the spaz 12 and the m1 garand with naming callbacks to some of the finest moments in the games produced by infinity ward talking weaponry further well dlc weapons were something that are again probably a go-to in a lot of people's minds for how they should be handled post-launch dlc weapons with Within infinite warfare were introduced in droves but of course they did have supply drop variants which were stat changing but the base weapons everyone could get for absolutely no charge whatsoever if you ended up having the season pass well then you were given these for absolutely free as soon as they dropped and you could end up doing whatever you wanted with them if you didn't have the season pass then it's okay because you only had to do a short little challenge here that in-game organically would task you with doing
doing something in relation to the classification of weapon and then after a short period of time you'd end up getting it for absolutely free something that that system hasn't been in place since then but it's definitely been the most consumer friendly and probably is one of the best things out of weaponry that we've seen in recent years overall game and gunplay wise well Personally, I don't recall too many times where in the Prime, I had things like terrible hit detection, and while I don't necessarily look for it, the game did feel fluid to me, and everything felt to connect whenever it should. A lot of it just came down to your gun skill and the ability to outthink your players in the movement systems at hand. And coming back to that quick reference of the continuation of while running, this was again something that was sort of a gimmick to players come the end of Black Ops 3 that they may have been cool with passing over or they may have been enthralled by, but when you analyze the mechanic in Black Ops 3 to Infinite Warfare, to me the movement, for lack of a better term, is again very fluid and it felt so much smoother than Black Ops 3. It was a more refined and cleaned up mechanic to me, which is an unsung achievement in MP of Infinite Warfare. Map selection was also something that, as with every COD, there are good and there are also not so good maps. But even while the game may have had some maps that were fan favorites or some players may not have liked too much, you'd be hard pressed to find a map that didn't look good. One of my favorite maps, not necessarily in gameplay wise, but creatively and artistically, was Mayday, a map set up on a broken down ship on the edge of a black hole. That's something that artistically was absolutely beautiful. If you're not in a space setting, you can't have those brilliant skyboxes like that, which were just absolutely visually stunning. Overall, though, the art direction aside, the maps, for the most part, played very well, and sure, like we mentioned, there were some that may not have been direct hits, but a lot sure did leave a mark visually, and some even were returning fan favorites from past games, like Heartland being the fan favorite from Ghosts of Warhawk, Excess being a DLC map that was an expanded version of the classic Rust, Genesis being that fan favorite of Strike Zone, Dominion being the fan favorite of Afghan, and Terminal, well, that was terminal. Even in the extracurricular areas of the quartermaster and customization, there were things that went above and beyond. You had your things in the quartermaster, like your featured tab supply drops and your armory, with a featured consisting of events or deals for items that you could end up getting for a limited offer that always seemed to guarantee you something. Some better than others, but you at least had that guarantee. When I was on the other day grabbing footage for this, the one that was available was a nuke hack, aka you're guaranteed any weapon that will have the nuke ability. I Meaning if you want that deatomized, you'll have a weapon to use towards it for 45 keys which is just over the price of a rare supply drop or 300 cod points which again is just over the price of a drop additionally there are things like an lmg camo hack where you're guaranteed a camo for any of the lmgs and granted those odds are a little less because you'd find that it's specific for one of the handful of lmgs plus there's about 150 camos in the quartermaster alone but you get the picture you're guaranteed something up front like that supply drops well here you found your supply drops and items that you had saved up that were redeemed drops or special bundles like the dupe protected bundle from the quartermaster cipher we just mentioned and then also things in your armory this was the closest thing that we had in cod since advanced warfare checking out your entire loot loadouts you had the ability to craft weapons you wanted in particular from the prototype lab still the one i remember the most and i used regularly was the nv4 fallout legendary with a nuclear ability you had variants for all weapons of all classifications available to be crafted for various salvage denominations and offered a ton of weaponry for simply grinding out the game the mark ii collection was just like your prototype lab but this time it was a collection for just your supply drop weapons as unfortunately mark twos were only found in drops but each had their own rarity and denomination that was a counterpart to the regular variation here of it but also gave you 15 percent extra xp per kill offering a bit of an advantage outside of the stats the mission team depot is again like all the others mentioned so far but for your mission team rewards as you progress your ranks through them another way to earn exclusive loot in an organic manner that didn't pit you against the rng of supply drops some good ones came out of this others well not so much but it came down to how much you wanted to put into each of your mission teams and grind out each of the ranks other customization things came down to your camos weapon charms and accessories uniforms and other things like that across challenges the quartermaster mission teams and many more with so many different things to earn in various different ways to do so camos there were plenty in game i'm a personally big camo person because we're playing a first person shooter so the only thing you're really gonna see at all times and really be enthralled with is what's on your weapon so this you ended up getting some things that of course you had your quartermaster challenges and other things some exclusives and some harder to find i'm still happy that i have the hellstorm camo 
Black Sky was a grind, but it looked fantastic. It took you multiple prestiges before you could even think about getting it because of the gold weapons that you needed to get in the classic section, which required classic unlock tokens at certain prestiges. The Quartermaster camo certainly offered a lot with, as of the time of recording this, 147 camos of varying rarity, some looking absolutely fantastic, all being available. Things like your weapon charms were additional things you could end up doing in that first person perspective to customize your loadout a little bit further. Uniforms were setting an era specific, offering a little bit more customization here, but not being too necessarily out there, such as say a bunny outfit for one of your rigs. But it was something that again, offered a little bit more customization to the user itself. So all in all, MP offered a lot more in depth than some Call of Duties, but just didn't really get the time of day. Outside of MP and campaign, well, the other third mode was zombies. Something that was dead center in the zombies craze for the past couple of years within Call of Duty. Infinite Warfare Zombies was something of a quirky but enjoyable oddity. We had come to expect zombies to be a dark, gritty experience, and we saw that exemplified by Treyarch over the years, and even with Call of Duty World War II's entry into the mode, it teetered on trying to be a horror game in and of itself. But Infinite Warfare Zombies was a completely different direction, and as a result, pushed some away, but also garnered a cult following of its own. With the first entry into the game with Zombies in Spaceland, it was much more colorful, whimsical, and a different entry into the mode, and this was something we've seen echoed throughout the rest of the DLC entries as that first year of content went along. It was more whimsical, yes, but also still offered a solid storyline that offered up something Zombies fans for years wanted and hoped to see in Black Ops 3 even in the way of a super easter egg. Something that was a quest throughout all of the maps in the game to uncover that last grand easter egg that required you to complete every single one up until that point. While the storyline didn't have as much time to grow and truly pull in players to get invested into the storyline like, say, Treyarch Zombies did for the near decade before that, it still had its twists along the way and ended in a way that allowed for speculation, adoration, and support throughout the entire time it was supported of that main year of content. Led by the fan first and foremost of Lee Ross Infinity Ward, the mode had become again an enjoyable oddity that still stands out against the rest of the entries into the Zombies projects of the Call of Duty franchise. At the end of the day, it is easy to dismiss Infinite Warfare as a space odyssey or space epic that has no real place in COD, but ultimately, it did some pretty cool things. It offered up some core gameplay, weaponry, features, and a narrative that could stand the test of time on its own. Perhaps the thing that doomed the title the most was just simply the name Call of Duty. Because if it wasn't a part of Call of Duty, maybe it doesn't have the expectations the franchise carries along with it. It could have been something well received as just being, well, a space shooter. And with all three modes being something that shortly after launch fixed itself and became a full-fledged experience on their own, it could have been something fantastic, maybe just not with that Call of Duty name. No matter if you loved or hated the title, your opinion is totally valid and I entirely respect it. But looking back, I don't think that personally I ever stopped playing the game because it was bad but instead because it was a combination of wrong place, wrong time, and that it was a very similar entry to Black Ops 3. Come November of 2016, I was ready for something a little fresher and maybe not necessarily a Black Ops 3.5 at what it seemed on the surface. Those hero-based elements, that wall running, and of course a space setting, but it wasn't bad by any regards. A few miscalculations in design, approach, and launch may have sent them a bit off target, and instead of landing at home, they landed among the stars and set off to make the most of a new final frontier they pushed their game into. And so with that, Infinite Warfare to me really wasn't all that bad. But that's where we're going to wrap it up. So let me know your thoughts down there in the comment section down below. Did you like Infinite Warfare for what it was now looking back? Maybe not at the time, but looking back, what do you think of it? Let me know your thoughts, but hopefully enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure you drop a like down below. And of course, if you are new to the channel, make sure you guys subscribe so you don't miss a single thing regarding all things Call of Duty, Black Ops 4, Modern Warfare, and anything in between. If you're interested in any updates, news, information, tips, tricks, or just interesting retrospectives like this, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single thing. If you guys also want to follow me over on Twitter and Instagram, there's the best place to get connected outside of YouTube. Crack live on both those. If you guys want to strike up a conversation, ask me a question, whatever it may be, that link is down there in the description below. But let's send that away. Thank you guys all so much for watching. Might as well express I'll see you guys later. Take care and peace.